I think it's just it's like a, a level and the argument from input marketing to in things is like level below logic. It's still good, it's still like, but it isn't like so strict and certain. With logic, you know what follows if the premises are, are true, then the conclusion is true. If in the means you don't necessarily it doesn't support all that. That's kind of I haven't studied. Well, welcome everyone to Maple Syrup episode number 41, logic number five. I want to invite all of you to come to my HIFL lecture tonight. Okay. It is called Margot Himmel out of Dystopia Hope. And it's just going to be absolutely crazy. I think I'm going to probably wear a backwards baseball hat during the talk. Uh, Carmen, who's our wonderful introducer, what would you call her, Betsy? How would you refer to her? The person that like the MC, I don't know. The moderator, maybe. Carmen was like, what's our dress code for tonight? I'm like, I'm going for scumbag frat guy. That's the, that's what I wanted. That's what I'm kind of going for. But I'm going to sing. You just like, you're a walking ad for that. You're just like, guys, I'm going to sing. I think I'm going to sing Frank Sinatra tonight. What do you guys think? Should I, should I try that or no? Mm. So this guy, uh, he, it's, it's in this place called New Bavaria. The story is set. It's in 2064. The country is totally falling apart. And this guy, he's like, he tells his girlfriend, they run this motel together called the Two Mallards Motel. And he's like, I have an idea to promote Two Mallards Motel. This is going to become the New York City. So it's a genius marketing plan, but I, I can only tell you half now. You have to hire me and then I'll show you the rest later. And he, he gets fired for the worst marketing plan because he just sings New Bavaria replaced in New York. For this song, he stands inside the the the, the new uh, Mallard Motel, and he's like, uh, "These little town blues are melting away. I'm gonna make a brand new start of it in old New Bavaria." <laughs> that's, his, that's his whole thing. And if I can make it there, that's his plan. And well, Betsy, that's one percent of it. That's one. That's one percent of it. Uh, I made a rap song about Ryan Alexander. We're going to start with that. Ryan, are you? Ryan, can I please? Ryan, please. Okay, fine. I'm going to, Ryan, fine, Ryan. I'm going to name this guy Joe Alexander. This is not about you. Ready? Here we go. Joe Alexander. Ha, huh, thank you, the great. Sorry, bear of the bad news, B. To the party, you late. Cause while you've been snoozing, I've been making crate after crate after crate after crate after crate after crate of bubbly. Not trying to get you in trouble, but bra, you second best, you part of the rest, you done me, your boy, I'd be number one. There you go. Okay, so whoever whoever Joe Alexander is, that guy just got roasted. <laughs> okay, Father Benjamin, thank you for coming to our class. Um, if you're probably wondering at this point, what is this class about? So, I, I asked Father Benjamin. I asked any anyone. This goes to it's a good review. Again, for our special guest, and I hope you'll join us on all the time. You're very welcome. Monday and Wednesdays at 8.25 um, each week. Uh, to Father, but to anyone else who might be interested, again, uh, we have a YouTube channel, which we're recording now, where all the old lectures are posted. And as well, I can send you the syllabus, but I will actually read you part of the syllabus now. Again, if you are interested, if you want to know, okay, where, what am I coming to? Where am I at right now in the class? So... What we spent the first, hello, Sam Cresslins. What we spent the first three classes doing, this is class number five, was talking about uh, introduction and fundamentals. Talked about fallacies, red herring, straw man, all that kind of stuff. Um, described what a syllogism is, inductive versus deductive reasoning. Talked about, is an argument valid? Is it cogent, et cetera? Last class, class number four, was logic at the foundation of the world from the book of Genesis. We, I argued there's nothing more, we accept you know, these truths from Holy Scripture on faith, but there is nothing more logical than things like the Ten Commandments. If people, if, if everyone followed the Ten Commandments, the world certainly would be in a better place, a more rational, reasonable place. Um, and we moved from Genesis, talked about Exodus, talked about some things Christ says in the Gospels, and finished the Book of Wisdom. Today's lecture is entitled uh, Socrates and Plato. Today's going to be a very simple lecture. Now, Father, you may ask, do we have a tool for this class? Is there a way in which we analyze things in this class? Yes. It is this algorithm that I invented that we can apply to all of our logical postulations. So the first A question mark stands for that there's this, this sheet once more that I can send to you. 
But the A question mark stands, the first consideration you want to look at when you see something, a statement, whatever, is it a matter of faith? We said, right? Question mark, is it a matter of faith? If it is a matter of faith, then we have to condition, we have to leaven our analysis with, well, this is accepted on faith. This is holy writ. We as devout Catholics, devout Christians, accept the Bible as the inerrant word of God. Let's say if there's there's nothing uh, faith-filled going on here. It's not a, a faith proposition. We're going to be solely working with reason. Four times, we're going to plainly state what the thing says. And this class, Father, with all this cool theory that I was getting my coffee, I'm sure you heard Betsy and Ryan, two of our very, very intelligent students, bantering back and forth. Well, mostly intelligent, usually. Um, sometimes. One out of three days, I don't know, sometimes. But there is definitely this kind of theoretical underpinning. But I have titled this class, or I want the guiding point of this class to be plumber's logic. And plumber's logic means a guy, a blue collar worker, if he looks at a statement, can he automatically tell using common sense, is this true or not? Now, if, if we can say on the first glance over, right, that it is plumber's logic, maybe we're done. But yeah, okay, this is a true thing. All bachelors are unmarried men. That is a tautology. Can the plumber look at that first glance and say, yes, seems pretty obvious. And it's very exclusive. Yes, to be an unmarried man is to be a bachelor, check mark, moving on. But if not, then we move into these procedurals, right? A through G, these are steps in my, in my form. And we, we have eventually triple checked this thing. But once you've triple checked it, and especially worked through the fallacy, you arrive at your last motion, which is stating your plumber's logic guess. So I have the sheet in front of me. I will re um, review this one more time, and then we'll actually get into to today's material. They should not be that long, because we just have Socrates and Plato. Um, just those two guys. But, yeah. but going forward, if you're interested too, again, I... I will exactly. I, I will happily again send you. I will happily send you whatever info you'd like. In fact, our wonderful Heather Meyer downstairs posted this this stuff online too on Vandal Catholic. But for instance, next week we have one more class with Antiquity Continued, briefly, and then we do two classes on Aristotle, two classes on Cicero, Augustine, and Boethius. And starting February twentieth, my friends, until spring break, six classes of Saint Thomas Aquinas. I can't wait for that. Um, and, and, and by the way, a last kind of point, the class is really textual analysis. Aquinas on kingship, Aquinas on justice, Aquinas on um, you know, political ethics, whatever it is, we'll read certain texts and discuss them in class. And so that's what we're going to be doing today. But a last point about this um, logic sheet, right? So in your first motion is A and B, first glance, okay? Second motion is the A through D, and they are in order. Plain stated question mark. Oh, that's still not good enough. Okay, B, what is the context and authority? C, are there contradictions and paradoxes present? After that, E is this is our third first glance B again. Can we state once more a purpose or a conclusion? If that's still not good enough, we do our fallacy check. Betsy, thank you for cleaning up the, you made it nice and bright, the whole thing. That was awesome. Okay, but I didn't get it to everybody. Did I get it to you then? You got it to me. And then I kept it for myself selfishly. I haven't, I haven't disseminated it yet. I got to do that. I got to do that. But the, but the fallacy check, 10, 20, 30, right? Might be unlimited amounts of, of you know, fallacious material. Once we've done that, we arrive again at triple plane stating our last time. And it's like, we got it. We got to do our final submission. So anyways, anyone have any questions before we dive into today's um, antiquity lecture? Anybody? Okay. First source, approximate source here, not actually from the source, because we are going to be talking about, we're not talking about Aristotle yet. Okay, Aristotle, again, is next week or 10 days from now. We're just talking about Socrates and his student, Plato. And Socrates and Plato, you know, are kind of BFF and kind of demarcated from Aristotle. And we know, who knows this answer? Plato has a very formative influence upon whom in, in Christian thought. What great Christian theologian slash philosopher. Very much so. And Aristotle upon? Very good. Right. Plato and Augustine together. Why? Both Plato and I think at one point, actually, Augustine was a bunch of things, right? He was a Manichaean and all this stuff before his conversion, but he was very much in a Neoplatonic thought. Very much about, we'll talk about this today, but Plato forms, right? There is an ideal chair. There is an ideal coffee cup. There's this ideal... Um, William of Ockham, who we'll discuss much, much later on, completely tries to obliterate the idea of universals in his, you know, everything is particular, everything is um, relative, so to speak. That's much, that's much down the line. It's not get confused right now. But uh, yeah, Augustine in some ways has this kind of form-based looking skyward, you can say, abstract thought. 
Whereas Aquinas, who refers to Aristotle simply as the philosopher, you, all of you know this, but probably a bunch of you, Betsy probably knows Aristotle much better than I do. He actually has a title of a dozen different people. Like, it's kind of, like he has the commentator, the philosopher, the theologian. People have been saying, the yeah, people have been saying, people have been saying that like, I'm like the Aquinas of our time. And so he nicknames people and stuff. That's what I do. See, it's just another, it's another way we're very similar. Yeah, I mean, okay, so what? Give me a, the first logical question. Who cares? Why is that relevant? Give me a logical reason. What does that mean to you? Can you draw any kind of because inferences from that? Eris, because Aquinas had, a lot, had, I'm just saying, he had a lot of respect for a lot of different people. And that, it, you know, it's like, it's, I don't want to paint a picture like Aristotle is like the only guy who's like, oh, that's the philosopher. No, I mean, it, you know, other people do. Sure. That's okay. the, this, this, the, the, right. the commentator. Yeah. The and and I would, I would actually, um, okay, fair enough. I still think his greatest admiration is for Aristotle, but yeah, it's not it's not exclusive. I would say, who knows the answer to this? Who wants to get a crack at this? Only the best students, please. Well, some none of you qualify. I'll just tell you the answer. Um, who is Aristotle? <laughs> no, right? You're like, you're like, I know the answer. Hey, Barbara, I'm gonna come right to you first. All right. That's pretty confident on your part. I like confidence. Why don't you give us the answer? What well, Dave, Dave, <laughs> I was gonna say, right. I was like, I haven't even given you the question yet. What are you talking about? Uh, <laughs> How is how is Aris, or how is Saint Thomas Aquinas like Saint Justin Martyr? Anyone know Saint Justin Martyr is the saint from the second century who has a very famous quote. People have Augustine. Our hearts are restless; they rest in you. These things are attributed to people, right? Um, what is the quote attributed to Saint Justin Martyr? I think he's martyred in 165 AD, like second century. So he's a thousand years before Aquinas. Anyone know what he said? But he's, Aquinas very much draws from this. Whatever is good that is pagan is ours properly, yeah. ours, pro properly Christian. Right. Whatever is evil is not. Whatever is true is ours. Yeah. Is there more than one God? No. There is one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Are we not all children of God? Yes. Despite the pagans being literally in darkness and not understanding the reality of nature, doesn't mean they're outside of that. There's no polygenesis. There's no multiple, you know, people or whatever. And so Aquinas is legendary for what some people would even accuse him today. No one would accuse Aquinas of being woke. But like he does draw from all these traditions and says, hey, if it's true, it's true. There's one truth. Truth is singular, right? Flannery O'Connor, the famous 20th century novelist said, truth is singular. Truth converges, whereas error is infinitely divided. That's right. And indeed, demons to rip, to tear apart, to divide. Whatever is true is part of this integrated whole, going back to the one source of truth, which is God himself. Hence why Christ says, I am the way, the truth, the life, right? The singular path. Okay, so we're discussing some foundational stuff though today, Socrates and Plato. We're probably going to sing more songs. Probably, I'd assume at some point. Um, I don't know. Richard M. Gamble. I got this book called The Great Tradition from a guy who I respect a lot, who's very good at banjo and pipe smoking. He's from South Carolina. So all good things. Richard Gamble in this book says, uh, the whole great tradition, of which, of course, uh, Socrates and Plato are foundational figures, is to, quote, make students unfit for the modern world. What does this mean? Um, anyone want to you know, break this apart? Ha Brian Alexander, proud alum of Wyoming Catholic College, will probably understand this. Uh, John Sr., the Kansas guy, his program would be this. Like The modern education should be, Gamble says, in this great tradition vein, maybe some things like Logos is, is aiming at. It's trying to make students unfit for the modern world. Well, what is the logical fallacy of modern education? What's the number one logical fallacy of modern education? Anyone know what it is? There is one above all, I would argue. One. No. Yes, you're correct. Not what I'm looking for. Wow. Uh, yeah, presence totally. But but kind of above all, it, like what what is that? That's correct. That to Pope Benedict, uh, tyranny of relativism, also true. But education wise, I encounter this all the time from students. All the time. Like I just want blank blank blank. It's this. This is the one thing. They've, it's not useful. It's not worth. That's exactly right. This kind of pragmatism. John Dewey, pragmatism, like, what can I get out of it? Oh, Father, you're learning uh, you're learning ancient Greek. Why? Father, you're going to learn Mandarin. What, why? What's the purpose of it? And you might properly respond. It has its own reward. It's just good to speak this language, right? Not like, well, I'm, you're, you know, someone's paying you to do it on YouTube or, you know, it's always about money or it's going to help you get, you know, this internship. The modern education is solely pragmatic. That's why maybe we're so dumb today, right? Is that we don't need rhetoric, oratorical skills. We don't have to even read. 
I'm just going to go into tech. I'm just going to go and make money. And so anything that falls outside the purview of that goal is irrelevant to me. Yes, that's what I argue is the ultimate. It's like someone like John Sr. Again, who you know way better than I do. Did, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know. I'm asking you. Is Wyoming Catholic College and those, those 21 Newman schools based on that in some ways? Is it a proxy? What's the connection? WCC is directly inspired by John Sr.'s idea of first school. Yeah. Okay. And all awesome. the Newman schools are. Uh, but WCC specifically, is. okay. Yes. And but our, our universities today still, okay, the low tech colleges, they would fit into what I think you're saying, but universities, they still have their requirements. There's so many humanities, so many sciences, so many. You know, so there's still that effort. Why are they the only for this purpose of um, letting people in the different fields to be able to communicate to keep our infrastructure going in the long run? Yes, uh, you know, I, I, I think they were founded on the idea of education. And then later, this fragment came in, and that's certainly a reality. But I think that's what they were founded for, and continue to some extent. To a small extent. Well, okay, I, like I will say, like my worthless two cents. Like, there's a lot of great stuff about the university system today. I'm not just saying that being a professor myself. Oh, you have to say that. No, like there's a lot of really good things. I think, as a general sense, if there's one kind of like, um problematic deficiency or you know Aquinas says you know an error in the beginning is an error indeed if there's one kind of ontological error in the takeoff is it just what can I get out of it even more so than relativism or presentism or whatever or you know uh hyper personification hyper personalization you know I, I need my education to be specific to me like my YouTube channels like all these problems I think the number one thing is that it's just all about how can I make money and that's the obsession with like STEM I think STEM is awesome right you know, mathematics, engineering, all these sciences, the hard sciences are great, but it's like, but if you can't read, like if you don't know how to write, if you don't understand what even is good literature, it's like, you're just waiting for a guy to get on a stump somewhere and be like, follow me. I have all the answers. Oh yes. And pretty soon everyone's goose stepping because I mean, only philosophy and history and literature, like teach people like read Dostoevsky's brothers, uh, Kazimarov, or especially crime and punishment. It's like, that's, there's just great stuff in there about life, right? About the conscience and the reality of good and evil. If you don't read that, like, this is stupid and old and boring. And this is some irrelevant Russian dude. Like, if that's your attitude, which then it's like, then great. Then you just look, you don't, you can't give what you don't, you don't have. All right. So Socrates says though, what is the real aim of education? Remember Socrates was this annoying guy who just looked like a complete bum and just walked around town and bothered people, right? You see, Socrates would be arrested every single day if he was in modern society for disturbing the peace. He just was a total horrible person, right? He's always going around bothering people. What is Socrates? He doesn't write anything to talk about a guy who's anti-education. You know, Socrates is going around and saying, "What is the real aim of education? What is it?" And he growled at you. He'd be like, "What is the real aim of education?" Ah, uh, <laughs> I thought he asked this question. You were like, "Whoa, dude." Okay, I'll answer. That's how you got people to answer their questions. What is the aim of education? We, it's not making money. It's not pragmatism. What might it be then? The real aim, aim of what? No, no. What do you think? Socrates like took this eat, pray, love trip to the Tibetan monasteries. Come on, no. <laughs> the real aim of education is completion. The real education is completion, to attain that which you were meant to be. Aristotle goes nuts on this. He loves this idea. Aristotle's like, the perfect pencil is perfect in its perfection when it's writing. But if you use a pencil to pick out, you know, stuff from your nose or clean your ears, that's an improper use. Aristotle's all about the proper use of things. And this is a Socratic idea as well. Okay, so Socrates just asks his basic questions. You know, what is man? What is the human being? What is the purpose of man? Why are you here? These, these kind of ultimate big questions, so to speak, go back. I mean, and I'm not saying, it, I'm not at all implying, right? That people that, because by the way, Socrates is fifth century um, BC, okay, right following the, the, the Pericles golden age. And we're actually going to talk about, please remind me if I forget, I am a historian and the historical context actually matters a lot here. We're going to talk about what was happening in Greece this time. Let's do that. Let's do that now, actually, before we dive in, okay? So between 499 and 449 BC, the Greco-Persian War is fought. This is great. It's like 9-11 style in terms of like 
In 9-11, in the wake of that, what was the, the rallying call in America? Remember 9-11 happened, what was the rallying call? We're all Americans. It's not, I'm a Democrat, you're a Republican. It's like, we're all Americans because you had external enemy. If you have 499 and 449 BC, the Greeks are unified. All the Greek city-states, Athens, Sparta, Corinth, everybody. Because we're all Greeks. Because the big, bad, terrible Persians are coming. Everyone, everyone's seen the documentary film about the Greco Persian War, right? 300. It's the first footage, um, first found footage. The, the gravity was different. That's why they're flying in the air and stuff. In the Greco Persian War, a lot of famous stuff happened. The 300, the fit, that famous, who has actually seen that movie? Anyone seen that movie 300? That's the Battle, battle of Thermopylae, right? Leonidas, you know, 300 Spartans, this narrow pass. I think it was excessive to have Gerard Butler shot like 600 times with arrows. Like one was probably enough, but it was like, you know, whatever. It's like, even, yeah. Anyways, that you have the Battle of Thermopylae. Before that, you have the Battle of Marathon in 490 BC, which is unbelievable. The Battle of Marathon gives birth to Nike, the product. In that famous story, the guy runs from the plains of Marathon 26 miles back to Athens, just declares Nike a victory and drops dead. It was a great sports brand, right? That, that's just do it. And their 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 slogan should be victory. It means victory. That's why we ran twenty six miles. Yeah, the Battle of Marathon from the Greco Persian War. Is that cool? Sweet, right? Yeah. Yep. I just love dispensing knowledge like a Pez dispenser. You can take another Pez. Uh, they're yeah, very low they're very low calorie. They're good. They make your. Is they're good for your breath? They're very good. Um, Sam Crestlands, for whatever reason, started a change dot competition of band Pez. I don't know why, but you know, I teach their own. In 490 BC, uh, you have the Battle of Marathon, Battle of Thermopylae. Over the course of this whole battle, 50 years, the Greeks are unified. They defeat the Persians, right? Periclean Golden Age, Pericles, the great philosopher king of ancient Athens. But what happens to you in 431 and 404? Uh oh, what, what happens? Do we know what, what, what this war is called? The Peloponnesian War. And Thucydides wrote about this. Peloponnesian War, oldest story in the book. We Greeks are unified, big bad Persians keep them out. Now they're gone, now let's fight each other. And Athens and Sparta basically commit suicide and the Greeks fight each other. And this is this is the age in which the philosophers follow. Socrates famously drinks hemlock in 399 BC, five years after the end of the Peloponnesian War. So this is where we are. Socrates is walking around, kind of actually bombed out post-apocalyptic Athens because he's born in 469. So Socrates actually served in the army. He's born in 469 BC. So Socrates would have been with the Peloponnesian War and began in 431. He would have been, what, 38 years old, you know? So, and he actually lives through this time. Okay. Now, uh, let's talk about logically. Okay, so I want to ask, ask that question. Plumber's logic, do you agree? Is that a logical statement or is that fallacious? Tell me why, you, again, plumber's logic style. We're going to talk about so much text, so many arguments. We don't have time just to go, let's do all the things. This is for you. This is for you on your own. If you like it or you may think you find it pretentious and dumb and just rip it up, whatever you want to do. But just, I'm asking you plumber's logic. The point of life is to become what you're supposed to be. Do you agree? Is that, I just want to know if it's logical. Yes, that makes sense or no. Why? Talk to me. Pat, you're shaking your head like, it makes freaking sense. I'm doing the, the, the kind of thing, like have the guy pull down the horn, the truck driver. Okay, tell me why. Why does that make sense to you? Logically speaking, what is logical about that statement in your opinion? Uh, it's, it's common sense. Around. Why is it common sense? I'm going to be uh, Socrates, the gadfly. Socrates will go around. In fact, we're going to talk about that in a second. Socrates make you question everything, right? To the point where you reach this breaking point called aporia. Or you, I don't even know why I believe that. So I'm going to like aporia, aporia you. Why is that common sense? Who says it's common sense? Why is that common sense? Why Defend that. To be the best we can be, to be our fullness, it's some sort of logic. Okay. Yes, that's correct. That we, um, okay, induce it. Induce labor to this argument. Let's see, go. Okay, so we um, see that um, everything in our world is born and matures. We are, we argue from induction that that things are meant to be born and mature we could also argue from induction that that we should be maturing spiritually as well as physically to be what we were meant to be okay this is the key words right yes. give me the give me the catchphrase of teleology what is the slogan begin with teleology 
So teleology, if you, if you have a teleological view, there is like a point, there's an end point. Christianity is teleological. Mm-hmm. Father Karapi famously, he said, right? What, do you know who Father Karapi is? Father John Karapi. He's an amazing, amazing preacher. And he fell into like some kind of problems. Um, but EWTN used to like stream all of his videos um, early 2000s. What, the best homeless I've ever heard in my life. I highly recommend all you watch Father John Karapi, Humility, spirit, Spiritual Nuclear Bomb or Spiritual Nuclear Weapon. He's an unbelievable, unbelievable preacher. Father John Karapi would say, that his Italian grandmother would tell him, don't fret or despair when you feel down. You should hold up the Bible. We know how the story ends. That's teleological. We know that which Revelation talks about. Maybe you don't understand St. John's Apocalypse, how that's going to come, but that's going to happen, right? And Christ will triumph. There's a lot of scary stuff that's going to happen. The Mark of the Beast, the Antichrist, all this awful stuff, right? You know, a lot of the four horsemen of the Apocalypse, the sixth chapter of Revelation, right? The pale horse sweeping away, you know, and his name was Death, third of the world, all this awful stuff. But we know Christ triumphs. Christ has already triumphed. Christ, Christ triumphed on the cross, dying is for our death, rising is for our life. Lord Jesus coming, Lord. That's teleology. Teleology is to begin with the end in mind. The relativist person, uh, not just disbeliever, a person who's, you know, believes um, presentist maybe, and just, uh, you know, anti-teleological would say there is no point. We, we don't know if there is a point. Maybe not, Maybe there isn't, we're not gaining towards anything, right? Christianity is inherently linear. We are moving from, through this, literally that beautiful prayer to Our Lady, this valley of tears onto paradise, Right towards the goal so a christian he or she should live with that goal in mind we're always taught that right you know meditate upon the four last things focus on christ because that's where we're moving towards that goal whereas the modern relativists say there is no goal there is no point and so the book of wisdom right alexander i think i don't want to speak for him but him and i both seem to like the book of wisdom a lot in the second chapter where they're besetting this just man they talk about just live for today don't don't let any meadow free of your wantonness just carpe diem in the worst way get you know crazy drunk party every day because there is no point there is no telos all right uh socrates let's talk about some things he says okay okay i agree i didn't think that's very logical i agree with that thumb up uh, of course i am let me confess my bias and maybe that bias the fallacy socrates is kind of baptized by the church in a certain sense like people are like socratic philosophy is good it definitely squares with the fullness of revelation remember christ though before abraham was i am Although Christ walks the earth 400 years after Socrates, I mean, he's he pretty he precedes everything, right? The, he's the eternal word through which all is fashioned. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. In fact, Chesterton famously says, um, Aquinas didn't reconcile uh, Christ to Aristotle, but Aristotle to Christ. Christ is that fountainhead for all things. So that being true, Socrates and all these guys, these three great ancient philosophers, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, yeah, I'll confess my, my bias. I mean, I love this stuff. I think it's I think it's logical and I agree with you. I love how you, I think it's very common sense. But so what, right? Let's try to step outside of our biases and just investigate it on its own. Um, Socrates' two great contributions, you ready? To Western thought are the dialectic method of inquiry. It's also known as the Socratic method. And this idea of aporia, or kind of like profound self-doubt onto hoped enlightenment. Catchphrase there being, Socrates famously said, or is reported to have said, the more I know, the more I know how little I know. So, you know, the the more I, the more educated I am, the more I, you know, I'm aware of my ignorance. St. Thomas More talked about this, if I recall correctly. He's like, if you told me to write up a report about Clay Zimmerman, Freaking, I can like just frame that guy in like five seconds. I know I can tell you all about him. I got one day to tell you all about Clay Zimmerman. Done. Done. If I have to study Clay Zimmerman for a month, uh, it's more complicated than I originally thought. After a year of studying the papers of Clay Zimmerman, I can't tell you anything. That's that's that kind of doubt. Just like that, the paradox. This is not anti-logic. This is not anti-knowledge. This shows how humble we should be. You know, Socrates famously right walking around looking for the smartest man ever, and everyone told him it's you. And he was like, "Ooh, it's bad. It's me. I'm a moron." <laughs> like that kind of thing, right? Okay. So, so two great contributions of Socrates. And that aporia is in contrast to the modern project of doubt, which kind of begins with Descartes and continues into the postmodern. So today, we're now we just doubt the idea of the truth whatsoever. Exactly. Brilliant. And, but yes, Socrates is like it's like. It's like the postmoderns will like be standing in a forest and say, There is no forest, there are no trees, there are no rocks. 
And Socrates, who is the one sitting in the course, would say, there are rocks, there are trees. It's all beautiful and wonderful, but I feel like there's a lot more out there. Exactly. Thank you. That's so genius, dude. I really, I'm serious. I love all your commentary. That is so, that's probably the best thing you've said in these last three years. And you say a lot of good stuff. That is, that, no, I'm, that is really great. That is really profound. Okay, I want to like break apart what you said, what Ryan said, as you know, it's just fantastic. Exactly. Modern thought, not to get too far ahead, but yeah, Descartes, you know, I think therefore I am, or realities in my own head is just leads to like Jacques Derrida and these guys who are just like complete deconstructionist. What is language? It leads to Jacques Derrida's greatest example is Bill Clinton in his trial. What is the definition of is? Like, what does is mean? You know, that kind of nonsense. Apart from the whole Lewinsky scandal and stuff, just kind of like questioning everything. It's like, this is total nonsense. Samuel Johnson famously said, thus I refute thee by kicking a rock. No, not everything is some matrix, you know, invented mind game that begins, like you say, with Descartes. So modern aporia or philosophical doubt is like, but there is nothing. And that's the lesson. It's almost very, and actually, time out, maybe it is very old. That's the lesson of the book of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is a very, I don't know if you guys know this. If you compare the Epic of Gilgamesh to the Osiris myth of the Egyptians, it's very different. Oh, the Egyptians are like Americans. They even have like bald eagle tattoo. They're like, if the, if you think the, the Egyptians are only like elitists, only the Pharaoh and the queen can go to heaven. No, they're like, if anyone follows Mott, M-A apostrophe A-T, which is like, would be there, them groping in the dark. Yes, that's a shout out to the allegory of the cave we're gonna talk about soon. They're just groping in the cave, only seeing shadows. Um, but they're recognizing, okay, there's some higher being, right? even all their kind of nonsense pantheon of their, their mythology, they recognize like the divine logos. They recognize order in the universe, which ultimately is Christ himself. And if you follow that, you can attain eternal salvation. Even if you're the lowest slave in this Egyptian culture, it's very positive, Egyptian religion. It's very like, if you just be a good person, you, you too can have paradise. Gilgamesh is like, there is, you're not meant to live forever. It's very Albert Camus, just live for today. And Gilgamesh goes to set out to find eternal life. And Utnapishtim, who's a survivor of the flood, very similar flood story to, to Noah in the ark. Utnapishtim says, um, if you can stay away for seven days, I'll give you the secret to eternal life. And he's like, done. I'm the man. And he's like, but you didn't do it. And he's like, yeah, I did. And he's like, you did it. My wife baked seven loaves of bread for every day you slept. He's like, ooh, okay. I guess epic fail. And he goes back home. That's it. There's no hope for men. Last point, too, about Gilgamesh. People will say, oh, see, the Bible isn't true because the Babylonians had this myth and these guys had this myth, the flood story. And I'm like, you morons. Like if one culture has this story, then it's probably made up. If all different cultures have this story, it probably happened, right? If, if one crazy guy in the streets like, oh, a volcano exploded somewhere, you're like, okay, dude. Then you tell me last week that birds are, you know, aren't real or something. Like, you know, okay, have a nice day. But if you hear from like 30 different people that have volcano, even the details are different, right? So I think that's actually the coolest faith part of the Epic of Gilgamesh. The fact that that flood narrative is so similar to what we read about Noah, it's like that probably really happened. We accept that on faith, of course. And that should be enough for us, the inerrant word of God. But it's like the fact that every culture has this massive flood narrative is like it probably was a real event. If you're just a attacking like a secular person, it's like the, the propensity of all these same stories, like it probably is true, you know? Like when you guys hear from everyone here, like Roshan is so brilliant. It's like, it's probably correct. Everyone is saying it, you know? <laughs> okay so there's two there's two there's two there's two uh, <laughs> yeah of all my exactly and i'm joking this, this i'm not gonna do this joke now well because i'm already prefacing it and i've done it many times but i got really good laughs the first time when i was talking about electron humility and i was like i was like well you know being humble isn't saying fake stuff it's telling the truth so, I mean, it wouldn't be, it would be false if I was like, I'm not that good looking. I'm not that funny. And then I eventually said like, and of all my qualities, humility is definitely my best. <laughs> Donald Trump would say that. Guys, no one, listen, no one is more humble than me. Trust me. I know humility. I know like high quality humility. <laughs> <laughs> we in New York, we have the best humility. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Are yeah, so two. So, so that's yes, thank you. And, and and I'm actually being serious. Thank you for getting us back on topic. But also, this is thank you for asking us. I want to make sure we get all the important stuff. Socrates, two contributions, dialectic method, or it's known as Socratic method, which is a series of questions posed to help a person determine the underlying beliefs or extent of their knowledge. And it's a negative uh method of hypothesis elimination. Okay. You eliminate logic one-on-one contradictions. 
okay? And, and you try to get down to a place where there are no contradictions. You keep asking questions and, and you know, uh, the dialectic method, which Heigl is very famous for, the German, uh, you know, idealist philosopher, the idea is guiding history. You have uh, a thesis, an antithesis, the opposite, and those combined lead to a synthesis in some way. And it's, it's negative elimination of contradictions. That would lead you to his second contribution, aporia. Maybe you eventually reach this point of complete philosophical befuddlement, but like right Alexander, perfectly serious. I'm being serious. I'm like being really like, oh, but it's like, this that was amazing. That's exactly as he said. It's not standing in the forest and be like, the forest is probably the matrix. It's saying, look how limited we are. Praise God. Isn't it cool that we don't know everything? Because there's nothing better than this cognitive impulse to wonder and awe. We can discover more, you know? Everyone's had that, that experience, right? When you're like, I didn't know that. It was amazing. And now I, now I know this is really cool. Even like the all jokes aside, but with Marathon today, learning that comes from that, that's cool. It's like, cool, oh, wow, really? Like that Nike brand, is, that's, I, I remember I felt the same way the first time I heard that. So it's fun to discover stuff, okay? Dialectic method of Aporia, but aimed at Logos and actually discovering things, not saying there is no truth. Okay, Socrates, let's talk about some things. That's two points. You can number them yourselves. You can do the mathematics any way you want. Whatever you want. You can do Arabic numerals. Oh, wait a second. Those are our numbers. Or the really boring, just gross Roman ones, whatever. Any way you want to number it. It's number three. Socrates argues knowledge is not empirical so much as it comes from divine bequest. That's interesting. That's not woke at all. Socrates is saying there's different talents. Some people are just more predisposed to be philosophers. Doesn't mean he would argue in becoming the best version of yourself. I mean, just make them. But this is what Christ says. Where does Christ say this? Where, where does Christ say in the, in the scriptures, become the best version of yourself, use what you have? What is the great example of this? Yeah. yeah. So the one who had five, he had five, two, two, and the one guy buried it, you were demanding master, you wicked servant. Why didn't you put my money into the bank and with interest, right? It's like just, you might have five talents, you might have 40, you might have whatever, use what you have. You know, it can't all be like clay, which is as good at everything. But like, I mean, if you're just good at a couple of things, it's fine. You know, I mean, Dave, you and I are good at nothing. So that sucks, but that's we're okay. Really but we're really good at it. <laughs> you guys, do, okay, I'm Dave and I are going to make a rap video called We Run Moscow. That's me. It's going to be in parentheses, the, the 208 remix. <laughs> so I, I can't wait. 208 featuring, featuring Lenny from Ladau County. Give me a guy we're going to, a character we're going to invent to come beatbox over the video. We're going to be good at that. You know, guy, get him signed up. Get him, tell him we have no money to offer him, but just the, the street cred of being in a rap video. So point number three, so, remember point number one, that I like to method number two, Aporia number three, Socrates says knowledge is not so much empirical, which is our science obsessed culture to study, study, study the science, follow the science. Everybody here follow the science from our modern day philosopher, Dr. Anthony S. Fauci. Right. Well, maybe it's not always following the science. Maybe it's a thing of divine bequest, which should lead us as Christians to say, I should before working pray, pray the Holy Spirit, pray, ask for God to enlighten you to the best of your ability. Is this logical? Socrates says. Here's one of his statements. Remember, textual analysis. No one desires evil. No one errs or does wrong willingly or knowingly. Is this true? Do people even who do really evil stuff look at like you know God of Mercy, Timothy McVeigh? who blew up the Alfred P. Murrah building in 1995 in Oklahoma City. Awful, worst act of domestic terrorism in U.S. history before 9-11, which you can argue is an outside attack anyways, but like worst on American soil. Was he trying, he really, he didn't desire evil? He didn't, in, in doing that? What do you think? Is that, I, I, that might, I think that kind of on face value, our guy Teddy doesn't sound logical. What do you guys think? Is that true that no one does that? Even people do quote unquote evil things. And I'm not, relativizing that i absolutely believe the objective good and evil period i'm saying like even things that we would you know that everyone would call evil are they still trying to do good in their mind really that sounds yeah, crazy themselves into it. so you agree with this statement or, or they're trying maybe they're not trying to do good but maybe they're trying to experience an experience they're not good enough. Uh, buzzer so, if, if we're on the game show you just got dropped in the vat of like red liquid but like, because I would say, like, in, in in against you, in contradiction to you, an experience is that that's not not willing. That's that's not not knowing it's bad. So if I ate a whole box of cookies, that would be Betsy. That is like Let dark. That is really cookie. evil. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Betsy, you had you had, you had a right to like a really bad example. 
For anyone on the line, Betsy, like we're just trying to have like a PG class here. Betsy talks about doing crazy stuff like eating a whole box of cookies. What an animal. Who is eating them? Um because I wanted to um do evil or would I be eating them because these cookies had these wonderful MMs in them and I love the texture and the taste. The texture is unbeatable. Breaking apart that shell. That is really comparing the acts of terrorism to that was that, that was the point of my joke. That is that a sufficient example of evil? I would say no. And Betsy Johnson, too, for anyone who doesn't know, is like a superstar of this class, and she's amazing. I disagree with that statement. I don't think, why you think yes, it is? Well, yeah, it's why is it's it evil? Because proper and so is okay. rational. It's not Got satisfy it. your senses, satisfy your senses. Okay, so no matter what, and I think it's what one but, John, one John 5 17, the first letter of John is not all sin is fatal. The, the distinction between mortal and venial sin. So but that could be the that could be more sin. You why could be sitting here thinking, I love my senses so much, I hate God, I don't like the fact so that full consent in the will, knowledge, and yeah, okay. But but yeah, Socrates Socrates claimed that no one chooses the evil as evil is correct. There's not a single person who's ever chosen evil as evil. It's all because they see what about Satan? What about okay. Lucifer and his rebellion? Satan believed that Satan chose a good thing in his from his perspective. Like he didn't choose something. He'd rather right. reign in hell than serve God. Yeah, he said that's better. Good thing. He, it's okay. It's all now. I'm not. It's, it's always a comparison. It's always saying you're going to choose this thing, which I think is better than that other thing, which is really good, but it's actually I think is evil. So I'm not. Okay. Like I wonder, um, back to things in the Bay and and those times, um, I think often there may be an experiential aspect. They wanted to revisit the crime. And, watch it in the news, et cetera, et cetera. You hear about that thing. Um, but also I think many, if not most of those, they have a message and just like war, sadly some will die, but it's for the greater good, you know, right. that kind of thinking. Right. Um, on the other hand, as far as evil for evil's sake, I can't help but compare that paradigm to, for instance, our local murders. Just vicious attacking of individuals for no apparent reason, right? Other but than that, Socratic, that Socratic Aristotelian generalization is still true for that man. Mm -hmm. He chose it, he chose it because he thought it was good. He was absolutely wrong, but he thought it was good. That's why he did it. If he thought there was something better that he could do in that moment, see, I don't know, I don't know that I agree. And like, in, in, a, in a general sense, I, I think like. Let's go back to the Timothy McVeigh example. Timothy McVeigh thought, first of all, he claimed he claimed he's doing that in response to the government's overreaches he saw at Waco, especially with the Branch Davidians in 93 and Ruby Ridge. But it's like I maybe in his mind, his warped mind, he was like, this is a higher good. But I think he I, I think common sense dictates if uh, Cardinal Newman is correct, and I think he is. That everyone has that aboriginal vicar of christ in their soul the conscience everyone is convicted by their conscience he still knows okay but in my mind this outweighed this thing this is evil i i i don't know i know that i agree that like you know and the, the example of satan too it's like right but it's, but it's like it's, the angelic wisdom is so much superior to ours well, that's why the angels have no chance for the demons have no chance for redemption yes. They knew the full consequences of this. I don't, I think that is building for that example. Some people do choose evil for its own sake. I think, but, but you can't choose evil or evil. He's choosing it as Satan is choosing. Why? Because evil is a deficiency only? Why? Autonomy and individualism is better than serving, serving the greatest being in existence because he is a being. He's saying those things. Timothy McVeigh is saying this is the end of fighting back against the feds. And what differentiates? Timothy McVeigh from Harry S. Truman and his the bombs. bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's like what should, what differentiates them is their position in society. It's not what they thought. Timothy McVeigh thinks I'm going to do this thing. It's going to bring about a good end, even though it's evil. Harry S. Truman said I'm going to do this thing, even though it's evil, because it's going to bring yeah. about a good end. I've never heard the dropping down bombs compared to the Oklahoma City bombing, but it's a fair point. It's a fair point. Like how many children were killed by the atomic bombings? How many right. children were killed in Oklahoma City? There's a very good book, a very sad book, but the guy, a Japanese guy who survived the atomic bombs, he's like a first hand account. It's just absolutely horrifying. Okay, Socrates says virtue is sufficient for happiness. 
Okay. Let that sit with you. I don't know. Virtue is sufficient for happiness. And you n number it any way you want, honestly. Yeah. So soccer, that's yes. It's like, I think Christian thought completes that and says that virtue is sufficient for happiness because you cannot have virtue without the grace of God. Absolutely. That, God. that is Aquinas, too. That is Aquinas' big thing, like continuing Aristotle, completing him. Is like Aquinas was of the mind. Aristotle is basically the perfect philosopher. He just doesn't understand grace, doesn't understand redemption, doesn't understand Christ to no fault of his own. Your accident of history being born 400 years before Christ walked the earth. But the right, no, a Christian exactly would cannot go beyond without that addendum. A Christian would have to say, no, virtue itself is not sufficient for happiness. You can fall into what heresy if you believe this? Someone help me out. What's the exactly, exactly? No, that's exactly, exactly what I'm looking for. You could take that all the way to Pelagianism, which says you can be saved without the grace of God, just by virtue. And that, that's a heresy. No, like we, we can do nothing but in him, John 15, 5, who is the, the vine, we are the branches. Like we can't be saved of our own efforts. We need God. What is what is virtue? You know, what's the definition? Define it for me. So 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 the Romans are virtues, energetic manliness, literal definition, meaning like. You know, the, those virtues, um, how sexist, right? So misogynistic. Yeah, well, I say energetic manliness and womanness, thank you. But manliness yeah. just sense doesn't mean like the buff macho. It means yeah, it does. It means, no, it yeah, it does. It means doing as much roids as possible. What is what is most <laughs> proper to man? Um, it means like, so when you see manly used, like probably before like 1920, it means this is the thing. Which the is cardinal virtues, man. prudence, justice, temperance, the kind of like the the, the, the right and accord behavior with your nature. Those are all things which are proper to man. Animals can't be any of those things. Right. Animals cannot be prudent, they cannot be temperate, they cannot be, they cannot have justice. They, yeah. Yeah, so, so th that's great. And, and combine that thought with Aristotle's idea of the golden mean, in terms of virtue, I would say. The golden mean is not mediocrity. It's doing exactly the right thing, but no more. The Japanese, actually, I guess Japan's the dark horse topic of today's class. The Japanese have this concept. I don't know what the name is. I just forget the name. I actually do speak fluent Japanese, but I just forget. I don't know that. It's not because of that. I just don't know the actual term. But uh, the Japanese have this concept of like getting in a warm bath after a, a hard day's work and like kicking your feet up or a hot tub and enjoying it perfectly because you realize I where I worked my butt off today in the office, nine to five. But I'm... but. Not going to work would have been bad, right? That would have been a fail. Also, be a fail is coming home and getting more work done. Workaholic told that. No, do the exact amount of work, then get in that bath and you, you enjoy it. You, you can't enjoy the Sunday rest. You can't enjoy the um, that bubble bath without the work being put in first. The Japanese are very, they're, they rival Americans. There's a, you know, go get it, bootstrap work culture. In fact, a lot of Japanese don't follow this. There's this terrible thing of Japanese overworking themselves to death, like working, you know, 24 hours passing out on trains, like they actually don't follow their own advice in this, in this sadly, but it's like, yeah, virtue would be these, these cardinal virtues, these things that are separate us from the, from the animals. Exactly. And, and um, to the internet, various, you know, things come up, of course, but it seems to be the key word as well. All of it is, uh, morality. Okay. Well then I'll, then I'll double down. How do you define morality? What is morality? Well, I guess it's hard to get kind of circular. circular sure. Yeah. Um, but I think morality, ooh, you know, a lot of the, like you mentioned, the Roman virtue or the machismo kind of thing, so many of them are, are grounded in a cultural milieu, whereas morality has a better chance of. of uh, this is why, okay, I would argue because you're right. Let's start, we can go in here. Our triple check 10, 20, 30 fallacies, circular definitions are fallacious, right? Virtue is morality. And what is morality? Well, it's virtue. No, right? That, that's not a definition. I would argue, it's why I, I designed the class this way, morality, the Ten Commandments are a great starting point for morality as definitions, right? Those first three things, duties we owe to the non-contingent being from whom all take their source to God, and then what we owe to our neighbor. And as Christ beautifully says, right? This is the law and the prophets all is summed up in love God and love all your neighbor as yourself. And then Mark chapter 12, and worth more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. So that, that I would say morality can be defined from like those principles. Or, or Dave, time out. How did I forget this? Man, wow. I'm glad I know. I'm not forgetting it now. Matthew 7, 12, the famous golden rule. Some people have said is the definition of morality, right? Do unto others as you have them do to you. That's morality. If you follow that in everything you do, Barb, would you like 
to have someone stomp on your foot, you know, please don't do that to me on purpose. It's a stupid example, right? Uh, let's do a more real, better example. Would you like it if you didn't see the light and you went on a red and someone just like beat their horn and flipped you off, whatever? No. So maybe don't do that next time to them. No, you, you, to the box of cookies. Okay, because well, what if it what if it falls outside of the what if it falls outside of the realm of being done to a person because it's just to yourself? I would say self love is part of love of neighbor. I think it's included there. But these Protestant guys, and I respect them, I really do, have this thing called I am second. A lot of these athletes have these things. I am second. I think you already know the message. Very simple. God is first in my life. You know I. Joe quarterback, when I was 15, did my altar call at my Baptist church, accepted Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. All oh, that's that's all beautiful stuff. Praise, praise God. Um, sincerely. And those things, like we want to focus on things we agree with with our Protestant brothers and sisters. I mean, praise God. And therefore, I am second. You know, God is, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, I'm not ashamed of God. Also, awesome. But I would argue that they have it wrong. They should have, I am third. Christ himself says, Love God of all, love God of all, your neighbor is yourself, then it's you. But that you being third, you still part of that. So you eating all the cookies, harming your body, which is temple of the Holy Spirit, is actually harming your neighbor. The neighbor happens to be yourself. That's I'd argue. Um, if if it, that's true. Your neighbor yourself, potentially. I mean, that's a tie. I mean, like, exactly. It includes, it includes both. Third. Exactly. Yeah. And, and Chesterton, Prince of Paradox, Christianity is full of paradoxes. Paradoxes are not contradictions. Contradictions are two things that can't be and they're false. Paradoxes are two things that seem not to work together but are. Like, how can God, how can Christ be true God and true man? So it's paradoxical. How is that possible? But it's true, right? It's a matter of faith. We accept that. That's hypostatic union of his two natures in one person. That's a paradox. Christianity, how, how is it that we, when we have receive our Lord's body, blood, soul, and divinity, still taste in the accidents of the, the, what, what, what was formerly before transubstantiation, the bread and wine, and yet it's the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. And thank God when God gives us these help makes in our faith and breaks the veil and like the bleeding host, these Eucharistic miracles and show us this is the reality. So that, that's, a, I never thank you for that. I never thought of that too, how that's a paradoxical conjoining in that love neighbors yourself is a declaration too. It sounds so cheesy and modern, super postmodern, love yourself, self-care. But it's like, yeah. So you'd be violating that, I would, I would argue. All right, guys, I want to be done here by like 940. I just can't take it anymore. I can't take like, hey. go ahead. Before you move too far away, earlier you were talking about the parable of talents. Um, some of you may already know this, but I've heard this before, so I just Googled it. Um, next time you hear that gospel, a single talent, and one of some of the guys got five talents and so on. It's worth a lot. Single talent is over two million dollars in today's. Yeah, it's like 75. So the guy, so 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 the guy, the guy had one talent was like for me, for me, for me, like wow. Yeah, he was still part of the one percent. Right. Yeah. So the five, the five million got ten million. Five million got ten. Ten million, four million. Well, so who is the Sam Bankman Freed FTX? Yeah, yeah. Guys, Sam Bankman Freed FTX, and God bless him. Sam Cresslin's connection, both named Sam. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the level of stupid YouTube nonsense. Speaking of lack of logic, is like that. So. I was, uh, you know, there's a stupid microphone. And like, so I was thinking, like, you know, this guy, Clay Zimmerman, I was just in New Mexico. I thought, like, I don't know. His name's Clay, and there's a lot of red earth around this Clay. It was just, like, <laughs> it's just disgusting. So we were talking about this secret surprise thing. It says Colin Mensa, and I noticed it's not Colin Mensa. And then, are inherently superior women. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, we're surviving here because we've all been in the hostage. <laughs> <laughs> I kid because I love. If I don't make jokes, if I don't make jokes about you, I probably hate you. So um I love all of you guys. Uh, okay, can we please get back on topic, Brad King? Brad, enough of just every second some kind of comment from the corner, peanut gallery over here. Okay, so we could probably finish up in the next five minutes. We've covered a lot. I, I'm actually so, guys, I know this sounds so self-congratulatory, but I'm so happy how, like, and it's thanks, Father. Do you see how good the quality students in the class is? These are amazing people. They're brilliant. Like, I'm not, I'm not even, I, as you can probably tell not too, I have an endless appetite for nonsense. I love to joke, but no, like, you guys, I, it's very moving, actually. And that does sound cheesy. But it's like, you guys are so smart. You guys make the class great. Let's finish up. Socrates is executed 
and he is, even though he drinks hemlock, but uh, for what they call corrupting the youth, in, in piety. And what it really meant was, that's why Socrates, could he be more, more based? Question mark. No. Could he be more Catholic? No, he couldn't. He's awesome. He was telling the Athenians all their pantheon of mythological small g gods was a bunch of BS. And he's like, if there is a God, and I believe there is a God, this, this non contingent being, he's going to be all good, all true, all things that is true about God. That's why Socrates guys get like these righteous pagan type categories. He's like, you know, the Athena um, stop Zeus becoming a bull to like hook up with young women. This is disgusting. This is wrong and just ridiculous. You're just projecting what the atheist, the atheist argument makes today, like that, oh, you know, Fuhrerbach said this in the 19th century, blessed be God forever, horrible blasphemous thing of just all man invented God. The, the, the Socrates is criticizing here. You guys just invented your gods. You want to like hook up with every maiden in the city. So you're like, oh, I bet this God, I bet he like has sex with a bunch of women. That's his superpower. Like, this is very base and vulgar and gross. And like Socrates, like, this is stupid. So the Athenian authorities were angry though, just as when they're angry and Paul goes to, um, I think it was Corinth. Where is the great idol city? In, it might have been Corinth. And he tells them to stop making their idols. And they're like, no, I, this is our business. You know, what, how dare you, right? So the Athenian authorities are not happy. Socrates is saying that, that the ultimate source of logos in the universe is good and just and pure and holy and not anything like this. So that's what he's executed for. Do you think this is logical? Socrates states three reasons why he willingly drinks hemlock. Ready? One, he believes such a flight would indicate a fear of death, which no true philosopher has meaning fight, run away from the city. He says to death, you know, no, I'm going to break out. And, and a lot of people like him. He probably has, probably wrangle up some co-conspirators to get him, break him out of the jail, right? I'm not going to leave because that would indicate a fear of death. No true philosopher has this. Number two, if he fl flees Athens, he's going to continue questioning everyone. Aporia, dialectic method. So he's going to incur the same penalty. I'm going to get my comeuppance no matter what, right? And number three, this is so baller. He's like, I have knowingly agreed to live under the city's laws. Even if they're unjust, I must accept them. No one would say that today, right? Well, I mean, I've been falsely accused, but I accept the authority here. So I'll accept this false accusation. This is very like, I don't know if you know, anyone knows St. Dominic Savio? He was a boy saint in Italy, died when he was like 12 years old. Amazing story. He's in class. Everyone hates him because he's 12 and he's holier than thou. That kind of, that kind of thought, right? So they try to blame the broken furnace being on him. Like they bust this pipe and break it. And teacher comes in, she's like, you know, an Italian, she was whatever. Well, maybe not speaking, but just doing a bunch of, you know, this kind of stuff. And like, and she's like, who did this? Right. And everyone's like, Dominic did it. Teacher brings him up. Did you do this? And he refuses to answer her. So he gets sent to like detention. And eventually the true criminal comes out, criminal, the perpetrator gets sent to detention. And the teacher asks him, you know, like, my boy, like, why did you not say it wasn't you? And he's like, I was trying to imitate Christ in front of Pontius Pilate by not speaking. <laughs> that is so baller, right? Like St. Gerard Magella is the same way, the, the patron of um, expected mothers. He was accused of like hooking up with some woman and having a you know out of wedlock child. Or even maybe he was like accused of sexual assault even, that she was unwilling. And so he's going to be like, and he refused to deny it, just said nothing. He's like, Christ, Christ also was falsely accused. I'm going to say nothing. And he was eventually cleared. That's what Socrates is here. He's like, I'm not corrupting you. This is true, but... If they judge me, I accept the penalty. Amazing. So he's a really proto-Christian guy. Um, this is why he's so beloved. And especially, I think I'm actually going to finish here. We'll do Plato next class. Yeah, because we talk, we've talked about a lot. I don't want to overwhelm you. Next class we'll do, especially as, as a kind of like looking ahead, because still in the syllabus it says, right? Yeah, the syllabus is antiquity continued. So great. And I, I, I'll allow myself this indulgence to save Plato for next class because next Monday, February 1st, excuse me, Wednesday, February 1st, and then Monday the 6th, we have two classes specifically on Aristotle. So we don't have to get to Aristotle next. Not, then we don't go to Cicero until we do Aristotle. So we'll save Plato for next class. If you want to FYI, look ahead and father a few, I hope you'll continue to join us whenever you're available. On Monday, we'll discuss Plato's allegory of the cave and especially his Republic, his idea that, that the soul and society are both tripartite. But kind of finishing with Socrates, um, the reason that he's so beloved in the Christian culture is he is seen as, as Ryan Alexander, who has to always leave for some kind of class at 9.30. Um, it's too bad he can't do this the whole time. As Ryan Alexander so intelligently um, kind of explained, right? The idea of like not denying the forest, just seeking deeper. He's seen as someone who's about the disinterested pursuit of truth. If students say we're like Socrates, 
society would be awesome if they were just looking for what is true. But starting, Dave Schmidt, thank you, shout out to you, my uh, rap partner, um, that people were just in a disinterested business of seeking truth. The teleology, acknowledging there is a goal we're going toward, the telos, society would be in a much better place. That's all I have for you today. Um, Betsy, you you were asking, you're you're a mathematics person. Betsy's daughter, we're talking for the class, is doing a PhD with a mathematics subfocus or part, right? Well, philosophy, and mathematics. Well, it's a PhD in philosophy, but she's particularly interested in philosophy, cool. math, and philosophy of science. That is awesome. In a math department, this is in the philosophy. Department. Got it. Math vis-a-vis -vis philosophy right. as part of, under the philosophical umbrella. Well, it, it, I'm just going to call you the math person in the class. You're going to go to you. I think we covered seven kind of points of postulations today. Okay, and that's, that's about the number I have. What number do you have? Well, you know, but if you add why Socrates takes the um, from walk, maybe we get into that. Okay, fair enough. So. And number them as you see fit. Um, I promised this class, for, I actually want to say one thing. Charlotte and Eli, you know who those people are? Charlotte and Eli are lovely, lovely couple from Northern Idaho Post Falls. Hello, Charlotte. Hello, Eli. They sent me, I'm confirming over the interwebs receipt of your wonderful letter. They sent me a nice letter, contents of which will remain private. How dare you? How dare you snoop into my mail? They wrote me a very nice mail, <laughs> very nice letter. They are a recently married couple um, in October 2022. Sam and Cecily Crestlands, even more recent. Congratulations to them as well. But Charlotte and Eli, I just want to say you guys are great. They claimed in the letter, I mean, I can't confirm it's true. They claimed the letter they watched these talks. Why? I don't know. But they claimed to follow this class. Um, so if you guys are watching this later, mad shout out. And they, yeah, you guys are all my favorite Catholic couple. I mean, Sam, you guys are, I mean, Clay, uh, I mean, uh, I'm talking. You guys are all my favorite couple, everyone. Just, I always say that in an individual sense. So just pretend it's only said to you. Um, okay. I promise this point, Charlotte and last Charlotte and Eli, you guys, I can't, yeah, I'm talking, it's like a shout out should be like three seconds long. I'm like going on and on. They're, they're the best. God bless you guys. I promise, well, to wrap this class, jokes. Remember to have comedy hour in this class, usually at the beginning, but we were singing at the beginning of the class. Here's some jokes. Ready, guys? Um, what university would you like to burn? These are jokes about universities. What university would you like to insult? Any, Betsy, would you like to, should we do Chris? Georgetown. Georgetown, okay, very good. Did you hear about the power outage at the Georgetown University Library? 30 students were stuck on the escalator for three hours. <laughs> Why did Forrest Gump choose Alabama over Georgia, or over Georgetown? Because he wanted an academic challenge. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm not saying Georgetown basketball players are dumb, but the coach is dressing six players for Saturday's game. The rest will dress themselves. <laughs> what happens when blondes from Louisiana move to Georgetown? Both places become smarter. <laughs> Let's see. Um, uh, why did what? Why did yeah? Why did the Georgetown grad? Why did the Georgetown grad cross the road? Better question: Why was he let out of the insane asylum? <laughs> okay, that's enough for today. Um, guys, anyone have anything they want to conclude with? If not, again, guys, I'm I'm counting on you. I'm counting on each of you to come to Hippo Lecture tonight with nine guests. Okay, so you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'm counting on 81 people from this contingent. Because I want, guys, it's going to be so sick. I'm, I'm going to sing in this thing. I'm going to have a backwards baseball cap. I'm going to roast modern culture. I will be busy parenting. This is you every single Wednesday night. Yep. You, think, you, think you, might, you think you might rearrange your schedule one time. Yeah. No. Send my kids to school at night and um, oh, bring them along. He already told us on Monday that we should not bring do not bring it. Yeah, no one, no one under the age. Of, yeah, no mature themes tonight. And actually, speaking of yeah, like I, again, I I love to joke. Duh, I love to be an idiot. Obviously, but this is actually serious. Like, um, for the purpose of like propriety, is definitely mature theme talk. The actual the book. This is this is a, a novel I wrote. It's, a, it's almost a novella. It's only 150 pages long. The book is insanely explicit. 
still very, very Catholic. And I, I tried to do the Dostoevsky thing of like showing sin and all oh, its awful, horrible thing and then redemption from that. Uh, this is a very watered down version. It's still too explicit for like, I would not bring, yeah, I would not bring high school people. But yet, I'm sure your daughters and high school people, especially today, are like paragons of virtue, who've heard a bunch of nonsense and are still fortified. I still truly, in that kind of like, maybe this is the most Catholic thing I'll say today. It's like this immature audience thing. It's aimed at college kids and upwards of us folk, non-college age. Like, yeah, do not like, oh, I brought my 11-year-old nephew here. Mommy, what does this word mean? No, please do not. It's not a, yeah, it's definitely not. But uh, I can't tell you how excited I am. And Carmen Eggleston is doing the intro, guys. She's going to say her name is Carmen seven times. And then she's going to, I'm thinking about, I might still include it in her, in her remarks. Anyone know where in the world is Carmen San Diego? You ever heard that? I think she, I wanted to say, so my name is Carmen. My name is Carmen. By the way, my last name is San Diego. Just kidding. But the real Carmen San Diego went into hiding. That's why they can't find her because she wanted to be compared to me when I was born. And then so on. I might. But like today's college kids might be a little too young for even um, that reference. Yeah, that yeah. reference. Well, no one would accuse them of being intelligent. So I guess it's one more, one more, you know, drop in the bucket. That's like, I think only my oldest would be exposed to that. The carbon San Diego exposure is a very serious thing. You're never the same after. All right. Anyone want to? Anyone want to finish with a song? I think no. I think no one wants to sing. Sam, do you want to sing a song? No. We'll National sing. anthem. Austin, what do you want to sing together? National anthem. You don't want to say if you if you say try. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light? Dave, stop interrupting me. I love our country. Okay. Yeah.